is on, is it? The blue light just to go there you go ahead. Okay. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome the following witnesses to the meeting today. I would particularly like to thank witnesses who have travelled at a time when the country is experiencing the effects of Storm Diana. Uh, representatives from the Geological Survey, uh, Coin uh, for Bruggen, Director, um, Dr. Ted McCormick, Groundwater Flood Program. Representatives from the National Park and Wildlife Service, John Fitzgerald, who is the principal there. Representatives from Clare County Council, Carmel Kirby, Director of Physical Development. John Leahy, Senior Engineer, Roads and Transportation Department. <coughs> Representatives from Erin Road Erin, Jim Mead, the Chief, Chief Executive. Uh, Colin Hen Henderley, uh, Senior Track and Structures Engineer. Representatives from the Office of Public Work, John Steedham, uh, Commissioner, Liam Besquell, Principal Engineering Services, um, Keen O'Donnell, South West e Regional Engineer. At the outset, I remind members, staff, witnesses and those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones or, or switch them to flight mode. Mobile phones interfere with the sound system and make it, and make it difficult for parliamentary reporters to report the meeting and also television, radio, web streaming, etc. So you might take a, a second there to check your mobile phones. I'd also point out that the, the, the sound system here, in particular the microphones, are placed there in front of you, not to uh, obstruct them with, with any, any um, literature or whichever. Um, so now I, I, wish, I wish to read some of the former notices uh, for the information of our witnesses. I wish to draw your, or your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17 2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. It is proposed that any submissions or opening statements or other documents supplied by the witnesses to the committee for this meeting be published on the committee's website. Is that agreed? Agreed. <clears throat> on the 23rd of May 2018, this committee held a public meeting on the question of flooding at Ballycar on the Galway Limerick Railway and investment in heavy rail. The committee has also engaged with the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport and the National Transport Authority. Six months later, we resume our hearing and we have invited the same organisations back to update the committee on progress that they have made uh, with mitigating the flood risk at Ballycar. The first railway in Ireland, in fact the first suburban, uh, suburban railway in the world was opened in 1834 and, and still is in use today. 184 years later, the Dublin to Dunleary line. It seems to me that we need to take a very long view when considering investment in heavy rail, which is capital expenditure with a long-term payback. Members of this committee have spoken of the closure of railway lines in the border regions, including Donegal, Monaghan and Cavan, the Derry Road, which gave a fast connection between Dublin and Derry, and the Sligo Leitrim Railway, which were closed because of the policy of the then Government of Northern Ireland. This, uh, this made the remaining sections of the railway line in the south non-viable. Members also spoke of the closure of the West Cork Railway, making it difficult to travel from West Cork to Dublin and back in one day. But it, it's not all bad news. Many railway lines were closed only to be re reopened years later. The Harcourt Street line was closed in 1958 and a member of this committee travelled on one of the last trains on this line. Part of this line uh, with a cross city link to the Brostone line which closed to passengers in 1936 is now one of, the, one of the busiest lines in the country. The line from Cork to Middleton, Dublin to Dunboyne, the Phoenix Park Tunnel and the Galway Limerick line were all reopened in recent years. However, the Galway Limerick line is regularly closed due to groundwater flooding at Ballycar.
These lines uh, closures are all too frequent and cast doubt on the viability of further investment in the Western Rail Corridor. This means that the uh, certainty of supply that rail passengers expect simply is not there. I hope that the organisations here today will indicate their willingness to work together to mitigate this flood risk at Ballycar. The, the, flood, uh, the following flood mitigation measures could reduce the flood risk to an acceptable level. Lower the water level by draining Belly Car Lock to, see, um, to, to the sea via Lock Ash. Raise the railway or a combination of, of the two. The committee would like to receive an update on heavy rail investment plans since our last meeting as well. Um, the Geological Survey is the lead agency for groundwater flooding, which occurs in karstic or limestone areas. I look forward to hearing what progress you have made with your study of this fl flooding, which occurs mainly in the west of Ireland, um, in County Clare, in, in South Galway, and other areas of Mayo, Roscommon, and neighbouring counties, and in particular in Ballycar and County Clare. Uh, I will now call on Mr. Uh, Cohn for Brugren to make his opening statement on behalf of the Geological Survey. Thank you, Cahirlock. Um, I submitted a, a, a statement there, which is an update on, on the statement we gave in May, and I, it's for the record there. I don't propose to read uh, through it all. Um, I'll focus on, on the, the main update. Um, as you know, we, as you mentioned, we have taken the lead on groundwater flooding because of the work we do on our groundwater program, which is largely up to this had been focused on groundwater pollution issues and groundwater protection issues, where we're working a lot now with, with, uh, with both EPA and Irish Water. Um, from the 2016 program for partnership government under the climate change and flooding, there was a specific objective on Turlock Systems to provide resources to the OPW to commission studies into individual problematic or prone to flooding Turlock Systems if requested by a local authority or another relevant state agency, which is specifically what our program was designed to do. And we've, we've now uh, progressed that uh, almost, almost to completion in terms of the first phase where in the first quarter of next year we will deliver groundwater flood maps to the OPW uh, which they require for the second implementation cycle of the EU floods directive and that's involved uh, instrumenting up to 60 of these tour logs with actual data loggers but uh, also developing a methodology for studying these which actually uses the European Space Agency Copernicus data so we can actually look back look back at the historical record um, and create uh, stage maps to show the behaviour of how these, how these have responded because they are quite complex in that they behave quite differently to, to river flooding which is a lot more flashy or responding directly to ground, groundwater. Um, so we now have a situation where we have real time data feeds from more than 12 of these uh, turlocks and from the flood mapping like I said there's, well, that's the monitoring side and on the mapping side we'll have that completed for the entire country by the first quarter next year. In relation specifically to, to Ballycar, the Torlox now included in that, in that mapping process using the Copernicus data, which we demonstrated, we had some slides at the last, last presentation, as well as the other uh, flood prone areas along the Western Corridor. Um, and this monitoring technique um, is still being developed, but the preliminary data for Ballycar is now available to OPW and Irish Rail. And we've been invited to take part in a technical subcommittee meeting uh, regarding the flooding, uh, which is taking place on the 17th of December in Ennis. So we'll be able to provide an update and make sure the data is being used at that stage. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for your of, and thanks for your engagement in this process and the knowledge that you're sharing and for taking this particular issue very seriously. Um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service can address the risk to special areas of conservation downstream from Ballycar, from Loch Ash and Newmarket and Fergus down to the River Fergus and the Shannon Estuary. I now call on Mr John Fitzgerald to make his opening statement on behalf of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Thanks, Chair. I just want to um, firstly thank the committee for its invitation to attend here today. Um, our department hasn't had any central involvement in, in this uh, particular project um, to date. Um, at the committee's meeting last May, I, I did set out for information some general background on how certain sites of nature conservation value are protected, the role of our minister in relation to nature conservation and as a prescribed body under planning law and also in relation to environmental assessments. 
While our department doesn't have a decision-making role in the technical funding and planning consents in relation to any project that might emerge in relation to Burley Car, I just want to reiterate um, that our department does fully appreciate the importance of this issue and is more than willing to work with the proponents of any project that may emerge in a constructive fashion in relation to this matter. I just want to thank the members of the committee for their attention and I'm available to answer any questions that may arise. Thanks very much, Thank Mr. Fitzgerald. I understand then there is a joint statement between Clare County Council, uh, the OPW, and Irish Rail. So I call on whoever's taken that, uh, Carmel Kirby, please, to make that statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Chairman, members of the committee, um, it was agreed by the three agencies concerned, Erin Rod Aaron, Clare County Council and the Office of Public Works, to deliver a joint opening statement to the committee. Collectively, we welcome the opportunity to update the committee on developments since May 2018, when we previously attended. Clare County Council were requested at that time to facilitate a process and to reconvene as a steering group to move the issue f towards a resolution. Clare County Council engaged with Ian Rod Aaron and the Office of Public Works over the summer months. The Chief Executive of Clare County Council called a formal meeting early in October and a further meeting was held earlier this month. The latter was attended by Clare County Council, Ian Rod Aaron, the OPW, Shannon Group and RPS, who are the consultants to Ian Rod Aaron. RPS have been engaged by Ian Rod Aaron to develop a feasible engineering solution to the flooding issue at Belly Car. The consultants have been given a more wide-ranging and a broader remit to include consideration of the downstream impacts and also to develop measures to mitigate against any potential impacts in the Shannon area of any proposed solution. A technical subgroup has been set up to liaise directly with the consultants and technical input would also be provided by the Geological Survey of Ireland. The updated report will take account of the following as necessary. The Shannon Seafram study, including the Shannon Estuary North and Mal Bay River Basin District Hydrological Study and the Flood Risk Management Plan for River Basin 27-28, Shannon Estuary North and Mal Bay. Recently completed and ongoing schemes including in Innes, the River Fergus Lower Innes Certified Drainage Scheme, the Innes South Flood Relief Scheme and other arterial drainage schemes and drainage districts and any land commission embankments that may be in the study area. Further meetings have been scheduled for December 2018 and February 2019. RPS are to finalise their new report and present proposals to Ian Roderan in the spring of 2019. From this report, the most appropriate technically feasible option to address the Bally car flooding issue will be considered by the bodies. This represents the joint position of the three bodies. We are committed to the concept of sustainability and to the delivery of optimum service of key strategic infrastructure and will continue to work together to resolve the problem on the rail line at Ballycar. And we welcome any questions the committee may have. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ms Kirby. Um, and I, I'd just like to open the meeting by welcoming the progress that has been made, to welcome the attendance of all the, the various different officials from the various different agencies. Um, I, I think the progress that has been made um, shows what can be done when organisations of the state work together. And obviously there's a lot more work to be done on this particular issue, um, but it's, it is satisfying to see that dates are there, meetings have been held. Um, authorities are taking responsibility and that a solution is within sight. But it's important that that solution would be identified and that it would be funded and it, that it would be placed on a plan that would be, be implemented. And in that regard, and I'd, I'd like to direct this question to, to Ms Kirby, um, I understand that the draft regional, spatial and economic strategy is currently um, out there for public display. It's, it's a very important um, document. It's, it's important that this um, key improvement in the infrastructure between um, you know, Ennis and Limerick, that that particular issue is resolved and identified in that document and that money's funding is forthcoming. Um, I, I just want to put it to yourself, ha, have you made a submission to that, Clare County Council? Uh, is it your intention to do that? Uh, would you support a submission being made to that document? Um, and just basically your, your, your broad view of that. Um, I, I think momentum has started on this um, and finally, you know, this committee and I commend the members who have, you know, um, supported 
me as chairman um, for, for bringing this to, to a head, uh, for shining a light on this particular issue and asking for it that, it that it would be resolved and that a plan would be put in place. I, I thank the members for their support in that regard. But um, g given that we have made some progress, it's important that we keep that momentum going. And I, I'd like that the working group that has been formed that are actively engaged and together, and the fact that the consultant has now been appointed, they're putting together um, you know, a report uh, which ultimately will come up with a recommendation and a solution, that that working group would report back to this committee again um, you know, once that, that report is published. And I'd ask maybe for the support of members in that regard. But um, maybe, um, Ms. Kirby, there, if you could address that question that I asked in relation to the draft regional spatial and economic strategy. Um, and maybe if, if other you know, um, members had any other comment to make. So, uh, Chairman, my understanding is that the, the draft regional spatial and economic strategy is due out for public consultation um, at the end of next week. Uh, my understanding is that inclu it includes for enhancing regional accessibility through upgrading, upgrading transport infrastructure. And my understanding is that the transport investment priorities for the Limerick Shannon metropolitan area set out in this recess include for the development and promotion of existing intercity rail and commuter links between Limerick and Galway, including Ennis. Um, just, just take a moment there, there's some phone um, uh, reacting with the, with the microphone. Just to have a look there, to see is there any... It's very sensitive, the sound system, and just... I'll put this away, just in case. It... <coughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, so the, the draft recess, as I understand it, um, allows for the development and promotion of existing intercity rail between Limerick um, and Galway, including Ennis. Um, it, I suppose it doesn't specifically mention uh, the infrastructure that will be needed at Ballycar to alleviate the flooding there. Um, Jim Mead and Ian Rodair might wish to comment on that in terms of making a submission to the draft recess when it does come out at the end of next week, but certainly Clare County Council would support a submission to the recess in that regard. Thanks, Ms. Kerr. Um, Mr. Mead, it would be helpful if you came in. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Chairman, and um, we will be, we'll be welcome the opportunity to, to look for funding through, through that forum. Uh, we always look at any funding streams that come out there and see where we can uh, add to our, our current funding stream. So, yes, we will, short answer is yes, we, we will make an application uh, as appropriate. Um, I suppose ultimately, once we have the, the, the correct solution, uh, we, are, we don't mind where the funding comes from once, once we get funding to solve it once and for all. Okay. Have you, have you anything to add to the opening statement, uh, Mr. Mead, in terms of Irish Rail's commitment to this project? Uh, Chairman, yes, Irish Rail are fully committed to the, to, to the project. It's been, I suppose, it's been there for a long time. We know that if it was an easy solution, it would have been done a long time ago. But we are very happy to be part of the of the group uh, now, uh, and there is a, a positivity about the group uh, to look for to look for a solution to this. It's not it's not Clare County Council's problem or OPW problems or Irish Rail's problem. It's our problem, uh, and that's the way we're approaching it. Uh, and uh, we will we will give it whatever resource it needs uh, to get to the end result. Thanks very much. I just invite other members there who have comments. Um, Deputy Kenny. Yeah, thank you very much for your, your, um, your work on all of this. And it's, it's clear that uh, it's probably going to be a combination of raising the rail line in some places and, and, and drainage or some means of, of mitigating against the flooding in the other areas. Is there any idea of the, the costs involved as to, as to or, or the breakdown as to where that would where we'd end up in regard to that because you know one of the things that always jumps up at us immediately in any of these things is if there's going to be a very high cost or what 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 nature of cost are you are you expecting in respect to that um, uh, at the moment we haven't we have just given the the, the revised terms of reference to rps uh, and they're, they're working out the scope of work with with, with the technical team uh, which has a member from each of the four groups on um, and the idea is, the, pl the plan is, let's work out what the solutions are first and understand what, what is a permanent solution and then start costing those solutions. If, uh, and at that stage, we, we, we will review whether it's, it's a vi the viable, what's the most viable option at that stage. We don't want to, we don't want to limit the, the thought process around it by saying you have only 1 million, you've only 10 million, you've only 100 million. Uh, initially, we want to know what the correct solution is. 
Okay. No, I'm, I'm just wondering in the context of making an application for funding. Yeah. It's, it, it puts you in a difficult position if you, you know, that's just the only, yeah. but anyway, yeah, thank you. Well, our PS are going to move quite quickly, in fairness. Um, we, we look for our report to come back to, as a steering group, we have a date set for February, Carmen, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, for February, so we would expect indicative numbers back to them by then. Uh, not having looked at the research report yet, but we probably still will be within the timeline of that to make a submission. Good. Thank you. Um, Thanks for your presentation. Um, a few questions for you. Mr. Verbruggen, um, you said that you were going to do an analysis. Um, have you started that analysis already? Is it nearly done? Or how long is this going to take? Um, second of all, uh, is RPS engaged to do, is there an agreement of the scope of what RPS is doing? Um, is it a is it to just deal with the railway or is it to deal with the flooding on a wider issue? Um, I know that you're using the, the, the framework that is there already, that has been done. Um, but at the end of the day, while it's good to see that you have a giant statement between you and there may be a few of you starting working together, um, when are we going to, obviously will there be planning involved? Uh, when will RPS have finished, ready to, if the plan is involved, to have to go and put the proposal in? And I know that the OPW are here, and in fairness to the OPW, um, around the country, you know, and to Minister Morden, they have been pretty proactive um, in trying to solve problems. But will the cost-benefit analysis that bogs down so many schemes be a problem? And what I'm trying to get to the nub of is, with Mr. Mead, I said you said you, you said you're taking responsibility. If it means raising the line, are you going to? Is it your funds that's going to do it, or where is this funding coming from? Because we're six months now, and it's good to see that you are starting talking to each other. But it's it's diggers on the the railway line, or else on the ground to get work done. And what I'm trying to to see is when will ye be on the ground getting the job resolved because if RPS are only sort of getting a, a, a guidance now, um, I've worked with RPS on bogs in different places around the country and it's a slow procedure and like, are we going to be here this time next year again wondered and, or, and, and the line flooded. Um, and what I want to see is dates, times, and is the money going to be brought forward regardless of uh, who has to cough up um, with the plan. But if I know that GSI have done uh, monitoring in different places, but these, some of this monitoring goes on for two and three years. And what I want to know is have you your data that you need to give now? Or is it now you're starting to give it later? That's, and I, I may have picked you up wrong when you were talking. Okay. Um, there's a number of questions there for for um, the OPW for um, <coughs> geological survey um, and for Irish Rail. So you might take them there. So thanks, Gerda. Uh, thanks, Deputy. Yeah, as, as you know from the work we've been doing in Roscommon, this programme was scheduled to run for three years and the date of delivery is the first quarter next year to have those flood maps available and that's on track. We've prioritised the Ballycar area after this, so we'll have that, those flood maps available for the December meeting. So that analysis has been for the December meeting, the technical... This subcommittee. December? Yeah. Okay, so to be fit, you have all the data for, for Ballycar. For yeah. Okay, that's good. Point out, there's no need to touch the, the button in front, okay? Just it'll come on automatically, and again, it just interferes with the sound system. Um, so at the OPW, um, Irish Rail. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Deputy, a couple of, couple of questions to answer for you there. RPS, uh, as, you, as you'll be aware, have done a study back over a few years. They have a lot of data collected uh, already uh, on this, uh, and we have just expanded some of their terms of reference. Um, they are on the case as we speak, uh, and I would envisage that they would have uh, be back to com job completed in six months. That would be our target timeline. For would that include, and John Fitzgerald might be able to come in on this, would that include, obviously, there'll be screening out and there'll be appropriate assessments, EIAs, and John, you might let me know, is there any 
word of a rope is to for anything like that. Is there any problems like that ahead of them when they're doing this? I, I suppose, Deputy, it's very hard to, to comment in the abstract without knowing what kind of the engineering solutions that, that arise uh, might be. But certainly we're happy to get involved with the proponents at any stage, at the early stages, to, to maybe to help to provide information that would be needed by by them um, uh, and maybe to, to, to give guidance in relation to assessments. We're happy to get to get involved in any discussions. But at the moment, I suppose, in the absence of any proposals, it's hard to, to give a comment on what the effects on Natura sites might be. So if no proposals, or we're waiting on the proposals to come in, so will that be, when do you envisage that the solution is going to be on the table? Is it going to be in February, March, April? and that you're going for funding and going for to solve the problem. Mr. Mead. Deputy, we would expect, as I said, your six months is when we expect RPS to have finished their work. So that should have the, the, the solution on the table then. That's when we start going for funding. Uh, you know, they doesn't have the funding to do this currently. Uh, and in our current financial planning, our five-year planning, there is, there is no plans in that, in, that, in that financial planning to do it. So this will be supplementary funding from some area uh, yet to be decided. We will, back, we will go back to the department, ultimately to the government, uh, with this proposal, uh, and th then funding is provided. So currently, we do not have the funding for this. Thanks, Mr. Reid. Uh, Deputy O'Keefe. Yeah. Um, first of all, can Jim Mead outline the effect of the stoppages? In other words. You haven't had services for five weeks, six weeks at a time. It's not like you, on anything, including the dart, you get the odd day that you've got a problem. Uh, you get leaves on the line. You get all sorts of things breaking down. You get physical accidents and so on. So we all know that no matter what transport system you have, uh, you get the odd day with a one-day stoppage and it's an inconvenience, but it doesn't infect passenger <coughs> trends. Have you any quantification done? on the effect on passenger trends. In other words, do people come back in the same numbers as they were there before, after the long stoppages, or do you lose passenger numbers in the long term, and does it take your time to rebuild it all back up to confidence in the system when you have these long outages which you've had in the past? The second question I'd have uh, relates to uh, MPWS and so on. You're saying you'll have the study done in six months by RPS. Will that include proofing with the various agencies, particularly National Parks and Wildlife, who will have to have an input into it, um, so that when we get the report, it is a question of funding, and it's not a question then of going around the agencies to find other ecological problems and so on with the proposed solutions, because I believe that should form part of the study. And when we get the answer, I'd rather wait nine months and get an answer that's comprehensive to all the agencies and then be ready to go for funding. Um, can I say that isn't it amazing how humans make life awful complicated? We all pay tax and we pay it into a central fund called the Exchequer. And I can't understand how we've made so many streams. It's like the Nile Delta now with all the sources of funding. But it all starts at one head and it all goes to one place to people. And there's a million little rivers and rivulets and islands there for all the funding to go through and you have to go to this one and that one. I put a simple proposal to you that we look for the money off the Department of Transport. It seems to me that that's what they're there for. And it seems to me that all these bidding wars that seem to become are just manna from heaven for consultants. But in the end of the day, all the money is going to come from what you and me, the taxpayer, through the Exchequer. So maybe we could make a proposal here to the committee that we just suggest to the government that they take the simple course and if this needs to be funded, they fund it through the one agency that can just give you the money overnight and get on with the job. Um, can I ask you, in the wider context of this railway line, because if you're going to invest whatever it's going to take, and in the end of the day, this always reminds me about the arg of the argument about Inish Moore and the beer. And, you know, a small island of 1,000 people now gets it's one of the busiest ports in the country, but you know, was it justified? And the answer to it was, you either build a pier or you don't build a pier. It costs whatever it's going to cost. Because the Atlantic didn't know how many people were on the island. It just knows how it sends in the waves. And if we were going to build a pier that was all weather, 
to do the job, it was going to have a certain configuration on it. And thanks be to God, we've got some fantastic storm since, and nothing moved into harbour. Now, my view on this is, whatever it takes to eliminate 99 point whatever percent, I think there could be extreme weather events anywhere, anywhere in your system. You've got the same problem that you've mentioned in your uh, speech down in uh, Wicklow at Brayhead, and it's a constant problem there. Uh, but allowing that you're not in a one in a thousand, or one in ten thousand, or one whatever storm situation or flood situation, um, it will take whatever it takes, and I don't think we should be shy about spending the money. Uh, you're lucky you're working on land. It'd be a lot different in the ocean. Um, can I ask you, you know, but what I wouldn't like to see happening is us spending the money and not having the service. So that relates to another issue that I think is in your report. I'm always a little puzzled about this kind of intercity tag. And I think I've mentioned this to you before. Um, we keep talking about the train from Dublin to Galway being intercity. The train from Dublin to Sligo being intercity. The train from Limerick to Galway being intercity. Now, reality is that I would hazard a guess that on some of those lines, if you started looking at the customers taking it, they're like the customer from Greystones to Dublin. A big, big number of them are commuters. And that the big growth is the commuter, because the commuter tends to commute ten times a week, five in each direction. For the intercity traveller, as we conventionally understood it, maybe went to a city once every three weeks, once a month. So when you start comparing, comparing one to the other, you're talking about a 20 to 1 ratio in some cases. Can I ask you, you mentioned the doubling of the track from Athenrite to Galway. Now, looking at the passenger figures from Athenrite to Galway. Can I just come in here? Yeah. Um, I, I'd like it's to. The, it's in the. I, I, I know it is. And I'd like to deal with the, the Valley Care issue first. Uh, we there, there's, a whole, there's a whole issue then in relation to heavy rail no, no. Uh, opportunities for. No, no, but the point is, sorry, can I just finish my point? Yes. My point is, having spent 50, 100, whatever it takes, yes. we then need to make sure the line is used hugely. Yes. And the numbers are growing. I want to thank Ian Rodern. But I think we do need to discuss, because I see it coming, I see it with the rural broadband, it's always a cost in rural Ireland is the big issue, you know, how much is it going to cost you, what can you afford in rural Ireland? So my question to answer to that is, if we've got a heap of people coming on the line, which we can, by other infrastructure developments in tandem, we can make sure the line is well used and has a much better cost-benefit analysis. That's what I'm at. Okay, thanks so everybody. It's very important to Valley Car that you Excellent. get a lot of passengers. Excellent. Well, point well made. Um, just prior to uh, the officials answering uh, Deputy O'Queeve, um, Deputy Fitzmaurice had posed a question to the OPW and he, he wanted a response. Uh, do, do you want to remind um, the OPW? Or in the, the line of the cost-benefit analysis in what they are assessing so far, and I think we have to be just one thing we need to be careful of, that it could be a bigger scheme that may alleviate farmland as well as the railway train. Um, is the OPW, who are they working with on it? Um, would they be open to any application that would be made in it? And will they take into account the number of passengers and the value of the line uh, if there was a part of that being made as an application to the OPW? You mentioned in your earlier question the whole issue of the cost-benefit analysis and has been mentioned by previous speakers. We're in the process of developing the scheme and as people will be aware it is a broader scheme. <clears throat> I think the original scheme involved raising the railway line and there was questions would that solve the problem completely and I think the general consensus was it would alleviate but not completely eradicate the issue. What's now been explored through RPS is looking at a broader scheme which potentially will have a far better impact in terms of keeping the railway line in that catchment area open for longer. Because it's a bigger scheme logically we'll conclude it will be a more expensive scheme now i'm just saying that we haven't seen the final scheme so the technical viability of the scheme is one thing the cost is something else and i think those two things can be arrived at 
reasonably quickly and are quite clear. Where you run into issues is the benefits. And I think there's been mentioned in terms of the importance of this rail link in terms of the region, the whole spatial strategy and all of that. And I think not wishing to dictate how this is looked at, I think it is important that all benefits, tangible, intangible, are looked at very carefully because the gap between the costs and the benefits will have to be taken into consideration. And that effectively is the answer to your question, Deputy. We do have to look seriously at the cost and the benefits. And if the gap between those is substantial, then it is an issue. And I think any funding agency, it is, as the previous Deputy has said, we're spending taxpayers' money. We have to look very carefully at the economic viability. That said, I think uh, we will look at anything with an open mind, and I can give that assurance. But I think it is important that the agencies, and I think we are working very well together, look at all aspects of this, all the costs and all the benefits, uh, and then make the decisions as to how this is funded and taken forward. Thanks very much, Mr. Sneedham. Um, Deputy O'Keefe made a number of points. He was directing one to Irish Rail in, in relation to quantifying, <coughs> said the number of passengers lost through a, a rail closure, rail line closure. Um, he was making a very good point in relation to, um, you know, will all aspects of this be looked at, this proposal by the National Parks and Wildlife Service? Like, basically, will, will the proposal be shovel ready and ready for funding? He made a point in relation to the Department of Transport funding the whole scheme. I'd support that. Anyone that can pay for it, I'd support that. Um, you know, but maybe um, you could take that, um, Mr. Mead, first, and followed by the NPS, NPWS. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Deputy, yes, you're quite correct. Uh, we, the, when the, that flooding occurs there, it, it's not a few days. It, it, it's a different, as we all know, without going into the history of what and why, but it can be anywhere. I think the, the, the least flooding we had was about seven weeks and up to 15, 16 weeks in some cases, depending. Uh, depending on. So the numbers trends generally on the line are up, which is positive. People are migrating towards public transport. We see that. But certainly, when the line is closed, we have to find, we put on bus services, alternative, uh, uh, alternative uh, options are, are sought by the travelling public. And it does, too. then the line will reopen in April or May, uh, and it could take into the fall that year again before numbers come back fully, because people don't change, change overnight. So it could be having an impact on the overall numbers, because people have to keep changing. And I think that was, that was, your, that was your point. But certainly, uh, if you trend it over several years, the numbers are, ri are rising. If there was no disruption to the line, I think it is a fair assessment uh, that there may be they may rise even further because people will get into a normal mode of travel, um, and the substitutions are are not uh, they are not as sleek or not uh, as clean as the uh, as the train is because people are chopping and changing between buses and trains. Uh, the proofing with agencies. Your second question. Uh, yes. Uh, when, when this report is finished, it will be with agreement with everybody. There will be nobody. There will be nobody outside the, outside the tent saying, "I don't agree with it." That is our plan, and that's what's being led by Clare County Council to ensure that, that we all sign off on it uh, at that stage, subject to the, any planning process that the solution may require. So, when we come back with the solution, we get the funding. We may then have to go into a planning process, depending on depending. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. um, the funding. Fully welcome the support of the committee to help us get it from the DCAS. I'm, we don't mind who gives it to us. We are not fussy. Well, once we get funding, Chairman, and if the, if the committee can help us achieve that, um, we, we will take it with, with, with open arms. Thank you. Thank you. I think everything there was addressed. Um, so I, I just want to thank all the witnesses for coming back here today. I think it was a productive meeting. It's important that this committee is kept briefed um, on progress. You, you might let us know through the, through the clerk. Um, a heavy rail or something. Yeah, we, we're coming on to that. Um, so I, I can, you know, we, we need to hold on to um, Mr. Mead and his team from Irish Rail in relation to the next section of this meeting, which is in relation to opportunities in relation to investment in heavy rail. Um, so I'd like to thank the rest of the witnesses for coming here today. Um, I sus uh, suggest that we suspend for a couple of moments to allow the witnesses to leave, and we'll resume with uh, Mr. Mead.
Sorry, yeah. Oh, we're back in public session. Um, yeah, back in public session. So um, this particular aspect of the meeting will deal with um, investment in heavy rail and the opportunities that are there. And um, Mr. Mead has an opening statement, which I'd ask him to, to address, please. Committee. Uh, as advised the committee uh, in May when we were here last, while the, the NDP uh, details funding of, of two billion for what's termed the Dart Expansion Programme, this refers to the physical location of these works. Uh, the benefits of the programme are national and network wide, giving more capacity for more services on all lines to improved infrastructure and, fleet, and a fleet expansion of, of almost 50 per cent. Rather than reiterate the scope of that investment, I wish to advise the committee on the developments in the meantime and how these benefits uh, benefit the national heavy rail services we provide. Most importantly, the continued improvement in our funding situation means we may approach the steady state funding scenario, which was targeted in the NDP for 2021, two years ahead, ahead of schedule in 2019. This means we will be properly funded to maintain our network and fleet, protecting what are vital national infrastructure assets. We will introduce additional Dublin Sligo services in each, each direction on, on weekdays from Monday the 10th of December, and we, and we hope to mark the beginning of a period of, inter, uh, of intercity frequency expansion. Further service expansion on the Sligo and Westport routes would be desirable, uh, two hourly on the Dublin Sligo and two hourly on the Dublin Westport. Fleet investment under the NDP will, will free up our, some of our intercity fleet currently used in the, in the, in the Greater Dublin area, the commuter area, uh, to assist in service expansion. However, further study would require on any infrastructure requirements to, to facilitate uh, such a frequent service. On the Ross Lair Dublin, we, there may be scope for additional daytime services to be modelled within the constraints of the, of the existing intensively operated DART service. Strategically, we are also working with local authorities on the route to address the medium to long term strategies required to protect the line from coastal erosion with 45% of the route in a coastal or estuary environment. Even though they are not, so have an, uh, an ambition to increase frequency of Galway Dublin services to hourly, and the National Transport Authority and Galway Local Authority's Galway Transport Strategy does target that rail service will be increased in frequency subject to passenger demand and usage. This would encompass enhanced frequency of Galway Athen Rye commuter services. Double tracking would facilitate this between Galway and Athen Rye, with, with an interim measure of a passing loop and a second platform at, at Oran Moor to give a commuter frequency of up to 15 minutes. This leads me to other service enhancements possibly, uh, possible in our, in our other regional cities. The NTA is also preparing a draft Cork transport study, which will include additional stations to be provided in tandem with development and with other measures to enhance frequency of service. We've been working closely with Waterford City and, Count, uh, and County Council on the plans for the Waterford North Keys, which incorporates a relocating of Plunkett Station as part of the integrated transport hub. We are progressing signalling and station layout designs to accommodate increased frequent service frequency and look forward to being part of, of, uh, of an exciting development for the city, the region and for public transport services for both. At Limerick, the transportation hub is targeted for completion, with rail services from Galway, Innes, Limerick, Limerick Junction, Dublin feeding into this. We are assisting the Department of Transport in the preparation of a feasibility report, business study on the development of the Athenroy to Claremorris line. We are working to, uh, to terms of reference established by the DTAS. Uh, Eno Dern has ad advertised for and will appoint a consultant to undertake a financial and economic appraisal. This appointment will be made and the appraisal will, be, will commence by early January. The study will take 20 weeks. Thereafter, this will be subject to a peer review by the DTAS uh, to complete the overall study. Work on our new National Control Centre has commenced. This will see a new operations control and customer information centre established in Houston uh, to cover the entire network. And through, mo and through modern technology, we'll ensure we have a, a central control equipment to enhance service performance and to cater for the expansions in service planned over the, over the coming decade and beyond. We're also preparing plans for a comprehensive renewal of track on the Cork-Dublin route over the coming years. The objectives of the track relaying programme is to relay up to 220 miles of track so as to provide a reliable and sustainable track infrastructure to allow optimisation of line speeds with an associated reduction in journey times where possible. This will further enhance Cork, Kerry, Limerick and indeed West of Ireland services. A summary of the main benefits of track relaying programmes are more reliable track infrastructure with, with optimum line speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, uh, to, and this in turn f facilitates reduction in journey times. Replacement of aged infrastructure with a minimum life cycle of 30 years. Future proofing for anticipated increased utilisation of the, of the route in the short, medium and long term. 
improve sustainable and reliable infrastructure for our customers on a key commuter intercity route. This approach will provide a model for future asset renewal and journey time improvements around our network. This is a summary of our plans for the intercity and regional cities network, separate to the critical requirements of the Greater Dublin Commuter Belt. I'm happy to take any questions, Chairman, that you or the Committee will have on the subject. Thanks very much, Mr. Reid. Um, I'll kick off there myself. Um, just in terms of um, the, the, that Limerick uh, Ennis line again, and I'm sorry to keep harping on about it, but it's, it's very important. D there is a possibility of, of establishing a, a spur to Shannon Airport. And I know there was a feasibility study uh, a number of years ago, but is it something that you could revisit and you know, have a feasibility study? Um, you know, have another look at it again, because it would um, you know, make the Midwest region more attractive. Um, connectivity to Shannon Airport would, would open up you know, the whole of Galway, for example, to, to the Midwest, to Shannon. Um, connect Limerick as well. It's something that should be given uh, consideration. I'd, I'd ask you maybe to comment on that. Um, in terms of um, the, the Limerick line as well, and I, I recall you, you commenting at the last meeting that you have plans to increase the frequency um, uh, from Ennis Limerick, and that you know you could do that by introducing more a passing point um, along along the track. H have you advanced plans in relation to that? And finally, um, in relation to the development of a transportation hub at Limerick, what will that mean? Uh, what will that mean? I, I know you're including Galway and Ennis and Limerick and you know Cork and you know in that transportation hub. Could you explain? what it would mean and how advanced are plans to, to, to bring it in. And my colleague, uh, Senator Polly Coffey, unfortunately he can't be here today, but he asked me to ask the, the following question in relation to the Waterford North Keys uh, proposal uh, to relocate um, the Plunkett station there. Um, you know, he welcomes the advancement in that. H how, how, how far along the road are you? And there's a lot of engagement between the the, the city and county council, uh, which is very encouraging, he says, and um, you're going to create an integrated um, transport hub there. So just expand on that for, for Senator Coffey. Okay, Chairman, thank you. Um, yes, there was, a, as you as you're, as you're rightly say, there was a study done back in the early noughties, I think it was, um, of a sport to Shannon. Um, and the result of that study uh, identified a, a preferred route. Uh, and it looked to Clare County Council to preserve that route for the long term. At the time, it was considered uh, too expensive to do it uh, at the time. So it, it could be it's something we can't take back to the department. It's not part, a study of that is not part of the current uh, funding profile uh, that we've been given. But I, I'm, I'm happy to raise it again with the, with the department and see if, the, if they will do it. Would there be a big difference to... between, say, a heavy rail or a light rail? Um, would, would, it, would a light rail sort of a Lewis type of... Um, you know, model. Would that yeah. be cheaper? Would, would, would it Potentially. Um, I think you'd be doing a different study because you, you wouldn't run light rail on, on a heavy rail infrastructure. Well, just, just to yeah. link it in with yeah. it, so, um, Yeah, you could. Uh, it, w it would be less expensive. Obviously, light rail would be less expensive. But as to the, the, the scale of it, I don't have a feel for it. Uh, but I, I am happy to take it back uh, and raise it with the department yeah. uh, and see if we can revisit the study again. But as I say, it's not, it's not in... Uh, that, that type of study is not in the current NDP plan. Um, as regards uh, your second question, uh, we, haven't f we haven't moved any further with, with looking for uh, a location for a passing loop uh, between, between uh, if we somewhere around Six Mile Bridge area, uh, either, either side of or, or in. Um, but it, it would be a part of our long-term plan. We just haven't advanced it since we spoke about it last. The transportation hub, uh, as you're well aware, um, uh, your three, four minutes walk from the city, from the sea centre in Limerick when you, when you arrive in Limerick. Um, there was a three phase uh, uh, transportation hub plan put in place. Phase one was the front of the station, which is now the plaza, which has turned out very well. Um, the idea is that the bus station isn't big enough for what it does, and there was, uh, as part of that plan, there was to be a new bus station brought in there uh, that you would have all modes of transport integrating very, very well. We have better bus station, bus station, better use, then people can come in from the 
from, from Limerick, from North Kerry, from Clare, uh, onto, a, on, onto a train and on, so that you get that you get direct linkage between the two. So uh, okay. all, all one, and that you would have that you would have plenty of car parking. You would have a uh, have bus. You would have even bikes. It's, it is a proper integrated hub. So we are supporting Bus Air and, and looking for the funding to finish the, to finish out the bus station. So that's where the, the transport hub is at. The Waterford. Um, I'd have to double check and come back to the committee to confirm exact dates, but it is moving quite well. It was approved by our own board recently, the project, um, and off the top of my head, I think it's a planning stage, or planning it might even be approved at this stage, but I'll check the exact point it's at uh, and, and formally respond to the, to the committee. But it's progressing well. There's no roadblocks. Everything is going well on it. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank um, Debbie O'Keefe, we, we have um, 40 minutes approximately John, to be out here. So I have Deputy uh, Tony McLaughlin, Deputy uh, Fitzmaurice, Deputy O'Keefe, and Deputy Smith, Deputy Kenny. Okay, so um, we, we like, I'll take two together. Is that okay? So De Deputy McLaughlin, De Deputy Fitzmaurice. Yes, thanks very much indeed. Um, good here, look, and, and uh, Mr. Mead, you're very, very welcome. And, and, uh, I'm a deputy for the constituency of Leitrim, Sligo, and uh, I welcome the announcement there on the 10th of December of this year that you're adding uh, more services to, uh, both uh, to Dublin and indeed to Sligo, and I think that's to be very welcomed. I suppose my biggest issue is, and I, I would just ask you in relation to um, the lines, the infrastructure, the investment that's to be made in Sligo over the next number of years. But I think one of the biggest complaints I have at the present time is that um, uh, the lack of carriages is, is one of the issues, major, major, major issues. Every weekend and, and most days, uh, we don't have uh, the lack of carriages and the condition of some of the carriages. And I think that it wouldn't be acceptable on the Dublin Cork line or the Dublin Belfast line. And I think that we are the poor relation, that the Sligo line uh, is the poor relation. And I, do, I don't think it's acceptable in this present day. And I see the, where you're saying that you're ahead of schedule with, your, with the, the National Development Plan. And I think that for the investments and that the money that's been invested in Erin Road Erin now, that it's vitally important that serious consideration is given uh, to uh, the area that I represent. And indeed, the people and the commuters that are using it, these people are entitled to uh, a similar, uh, if not as good as, um, to any other part of the country, but we're not getting it. I mean, when people are subjected to having to stand from Dublin, to perhaps to, down to Carrick and Shannon, uh, and Longford, and indeed even into Sligo on some occasions, and likewise in, in the opposite direction, in this day and age, it's not acceptable. It's not good enough, Chairman. And I think that it's vitally important that you here this morning, um, and that's the reason I'm not a member of the committee, but uh, having been told that, that you are coming in here this morning, seeing your report that I've, I have read, and I think that it's vitally important that you have an obligation and you have a responsibility to the people and the commuters. That that are using it from uh, Sligo and vice versa for the, all of the people that are, are uh, operating from uh, Dublin and using the, that line on a daily basis. And we have increased uh, the number of services over the last, and you have indeed increased the number of services uh, to uh, Sligo and, and to Dublin. But I think that uh, what we are getting is a second rate service, and it's not acceptable in this present time. And I'd like to know, in relation to its cost, it's taken three hours to come from. from, um, from uh, Sligo to Dublin. Is there any um, word of any investment in relation to, I see where you're talking about in other areas, uh, upgrading the lines and, and uh, um, you know, to, to increase the, the, the speed and, and to reduce the, the, the time. But uh, is there any um, plans on our end of the, the, the country in relation to that? And what is your, um, just finally, Chairman, in relation to uh, the carriages, the, 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 the reject carriages, uh, what people are saying to me, and I'm, a, I'm a, a public representative for that area for many, many years, both myself and, and Councillor Kenny and other Oireachtas members, and indeed local councillors as well, and they're very, very annoyed, and this has been highlighted at, at, on numerous occasions, and you've been made aware of it, and your, your officials have been made aware of it, so I think it's vitally important now that you can uh, confirm to me here this morning that you will look at this very, very seriously, that you will uh, upgrade and that you will invest funding on this line, because we are entitled, and 
People are saying it to me all of the time. Uh, it wouldn't happen on, on, the, on the Cork line. It wouldn't happen on the Belfast line. It wouldn't happen on any other line in the country. But we are the poor relation, and it's, it's, it's time now that, that, um, you have, that you take the responsibility here this morning, Mr Mead, for to uh, give me a clarification and to give me an upgrade, uh, an update on what you can do and what you're proposing to do uh, over the next number of years. Thank you, Thanks Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, Deputy Fitzmaurice. Uh, thanks uh, for your uh, submission. Um, in the line of the train stations, there look at several deputies. I think has been on. Kessary was one I was on about lately. I would ask you to do a refurbishment um, to basically make it look good to go into a train station. Um, some of the train stations aren't that very well maintained at the moment. I would ask you to do that. Second of all, you talked about the high-speed trains. Um, when are we going to uh, on the high-speed trains? Is 100 going to be our maximum that we get? Um, and when will that be achieved? In the line of, as the previous deputy McLachlan pointed out, there's carriages needed. There's people standing up on trains, and there's carriages needed. When will that, in the 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 Sligo train, in the Westport train, and in the Galway train, when will that be uh, up? To, I do welcome. Your announcement on more services. I've been on about this for a good while. And the other thing I want to know, and if you could be very clear on this, um, the rail review for the Western Corridor uh, is supposed to have commenced. You're supposed to be doing it. And can you tell me, have you started and when you're going to be finished? Thanks, Deputy. I'll take, I'll take one more, uh, Deputy O'Queen. Um, I'm going to be mainly parochial today, but um, before I get into the parish, there's one project, and it's complementary to the project that was mentioned by the chairman, that I can't get my head around government not proceeding with, and that's connecting Dublin Air Airport into the main rail system. It would allow mainline trains using the tunnel, uh, to go north, south, east, west. Uh, it would also uh, allow for a connection into the whole system, um, including the DART. Now, I was wondering, you know, can you give us just a short brief on why what seems to be a no-brainer for what would be hundreds of millions as compared to billions and a much longer project to do the Metro North, and I'm not against that as well. Uh, why aren't we connecting the rail system in? Because when you go abroad to any other airport, the first thing you do if you're on public transport is to see is there a train, and if there's a train, you go into the train station, and you get very, very good services into centre city. Um, just on the west of Ireland, servicing, serving into Galway, um, what I'm, I see what you're saying about going on an hourly basis into Galway. And I think you do need an all-day service right into the late, late evening. But what we do also know, keeping going back to this hobby horse of mine about the commuters, that they want to get into town sometimes between eight and half past nine. So you need the trains coming in at a much increased frequency at that time. And then it's a bit more spread out in the evening from leaving from half four, seven o'clock, and then because people don't leave town always after work, it's a bit spread out late into the evening, and you need late evening trains, as you have here, for example, in Dublin up to half eleven. I'm wondering, number one, have you studied the potential with existing resources, because you know you can't magic resources, the potential for facilitating more commuter time trains in and out of Galway? And one of the obvious ones that would strike me is we notice a big disproportionate amount of commuters from, based on the population of the town from Athenry to Galway. It seems to me that's based on frequency. So my question then is, should there be more trains running, for example, from Limerick to Athenry and that you change from one train and get five minutes later get on the commuter train into Galway um, or onto the Dublin-Galway train? Because 
it seems that it's a very urgent requirement to get much more frequent trains into Galway. That will breed success, and the success will breed investment, the investment will breed success and so on. The other obvious question that arises, you mentioned the passing loop. I think that will be a good start. I th think your timing's optimistic. It's 40 minutes out to, uh, it's 20 minutes out to Athenry, so divided by two is 10, so that means it's 20 minutes intervals, but even that would be better than 40. Um, but I, I, I was wondering how seriously is that one small piece that would really free up things, how seriously is that being considered as a priority? Just the passing loop, as you said, somewhere around or more. The other question I'd have is at the ends of that railway line on the Limerick end and on the Galway end, has consideration been given for commuter trains that would have uh, urban stops on them? Galway is a rapidly growing city. I understand there's a big number of people travelling from Oramore to Galway and that that's growing rapidly and the only constraint there really is the frequency of the trains. Uh, I was wondering, you know, has there been any talk of Balilachan serving GMIT or whatever? Has there been any talk of an equivalent where it crosses the river uh, near the university in Limerick? It also goes very near Thoman Park and the IT coming down. Has there been talk of rather than bringing everybody into Centre City and out again, that they could get off near the IT and have a little commuter bus to the IT or to Thoman Park? Um, so, uh, you know, this whole new fashion people have in relation to trains, and people don't always use their car or always use the train. Most of us are multimodal now, and we love taking the train when it's convenient. So I just wonder how much work has been done around this whole thing, and I think that that leads to an inevitable conclusion that I believe that will be successful. That will open the Claremont line despite you. I don't mean despite you. I know Aaron Road Aaron wants to do it, but despite the people who have naysayed that for a long time, because I think commuter rail is the future. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Mr. Mead, you want to address the, the okay. Deputy? Thank speech. you, Chairman. Um, Deputy uh, McLaughlin, yes, uh, there's no question the trains are crowded. Uh, right across the network, uh, what your constituents in Sligo are saying to you is no different to what I've been told in Limerick, in Galway, in Westport, in Waterford. Uh, our numbers have grown significantly in the last three or four years in particular. Uh, we've been growing at between 6 and 7 per cent per year. Uh, and some segments of the uh, some segmental areas have been growing much faster than that. Uh, we don't want to start teaching each other history lessons here, but we have to, we have to remember we've come out of 10 years of no investment. <coughs> Uh, of, of no investment. We have started the process, and I'm happy to say just uh, just over a week ago, uh, the NTA gave us the green light to start procuring fleets, because we need, we need more fleet, we need more capacity, uh, particularly, particularly in the morning peak. But the lead time on, on, on fleet for any rail company, not just for us, for any, for any rail company, the best rail companies in the world, for brand new fleet, uh, can be up to four years. Uh, we have a plan in house that we have taken to the NTA and that they have signed off on, as I say, to add more carriages to the existing trains, to the intercity trains that, that, that we keep referring to. Um, and that is, that is a slicker uh, process for us. Uh, less, less issues would put them in service because you're just lengthening uh, existing trains. We have started that. Uh, process, but that we won't see those trains in service until the summer of 21, realistically. Uh, Jim, just sorry for, I understood that you had 40 carriages or something that you were uh, refurbishing. Yeah. Are they out on the road now? The, they're not. The costs of refurbishing them are uh, are through the roof. Uh, it's actually it's 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 the timeline is the same and it's cheaper to do this. So is, is the a, new trains you're buying, buying, what are they? They're in, they're intercity ICRs, the same as the as the existing uh, the diesel. Uh, the diesel. Well, they'll be they'll be they'll be hybrid. Because one of the things that we're doing is this whole fleet is being converted to hybrid over the next few years, which will give us a, in excess of a 30% reduction in our diesel burn, and will will allow us run through built-up areas uh, on batteries only. So we will we'll be eliminating some noise pollution as well. So it's it's something that we signed off on uh, there in the middle of the year with the test the test with Rolls Royce and with MTU the suppliers to run a couple of test trains. We've done all the numbers. It will be very successful, and we we will be able to make that entire fleet hybrid. Uh, which is obviously the, the, the way to go. On the issue of the carriages themselves, 
Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with the, with the early services out of Sligo. The first two services out of the Cork in the morning are, are the very same trains. They're Hyundai Rotems. I get one of them regularly myself up in Clare, uh, and they're the very same trains that Sligo people get on. So they're not getting sec second-class uh, fleet. Uh, and in point of fact, a few years ago, uh, but by about five, we probably have been overtaken at this stage. But we did have the youngest fleet in Europe at one stage. So our trains are not second-class. They are very heavily subscribed at the moment. There's a lot of people migrate. So, so the carriages that are on the line. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no, I know, but, but, uh, but the, the, the fleet are the, the fleet are state of the, uh, state of the art fleet. Uh, but the, pe per, the travelling public experience, because it's so busy, isn't good. I, I, I accept that. Uh, and I think we have to be honest with, 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 with the travelling public and tell them it's going to get a bit worse before it gets better because there's more and more people migrating onto public transport. It is the quickest way, uh, in a lot of cases, to, to, to get between two key locations. Um, and the numbers are growing. So our patronage is growing. The morning peak for us, particularly in the greater Dublin area, uh, is very, very, very busy. So we are, being, we are saying to people openly and honestly, we have a plan. We're working with the, with the NTA and with the Department of Transport. They're putting the funding in place. But there's a lead time on this. There is a lead time on it. It's only, la it was only early this year, late last year, the NDP programme was announced. So in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've gone through the process and they uh, have given us the green light to go and start procuring uh, the, the intermediate cars. There's a longer term plan for to put a framework order in place for 600 new vehicles uh, and take some of the, uh, over time, o over a 10 year framework. So that will all add capacity as we go. But uh, I have to be clear with, with, with the chairman and with the committee, it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better from that point of view, because we just don't have the capacity. Uh, speed, uh, uh, speed and time, it would be our intention, uh, as we now have reached a fully, funding, a fully funded state, um, to continue to upgrade the infrastructure. And that's what we've done in other routes. Uh, the Cork line, uh, it's not getting priority, it, ha it happens to have the oldest infrastructure. So, uh, I mean, the Sligo line, uh, the Galway line, the Kerry line, they were all, they were all relayed in, in, in the noughties, uh, in the mid-noughties, so it's all new track by comparison to what's on the southern half of the Cork line. Um, it's a much, much older track, that's why the, that, the relaying programme is, is, is going that way, because it's all based on the condition of the asset, not, not on, on, on the frequency of, of the line. But there is a, there is, we will work through a plan for all the branch lines um, to reduce the journey times. We have. Uh, our long-term target is to bring the Cork services to kind of 2 hours 15 for all services. They're currently 2.30, 2.35. Um, bring Galway to 2 hours. Bring, bring the likes of Westport and, 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 and Sligo nearer the 2.5 hours on the current 3 hours. And that's done through uh, improving works on the track and increasing line speeds. Uh, and the two go hand in hand. If the condition of your, the condition of your asset that the, the train is running on improves and we can run faster speeds, then we run faster speeds. And there's sometimes a trade-off, because if we want to bring uh, a key business train out of Saigo or out of Cork or out of Limerick or whatever, the more you stop, you slow it down. So when you add in stops, you slow it down. We are putting a more frequent service over time. I mean, the Maynooth line is very busy from Maynooth in, so it's about having the, having the, the, the slots to get, to get everybody into Dublin uh, and into the city centre. But, so the plan is very much to keep, keep moving with the programme uh, and, and to keep reducing journey times. Uh, if I, uh, the refurbishment of stations, uh, we have a programme now started uh, last year to start going through all our stations, because again, during the bad years, that was something we stopped. We didn't, you know, we, we, we were able to live without, without, without keeping, or keeping up the, that issues. We had to look after the safety issues. So there is a programme has started, and we have uh, this, last year and this year we have put more, we have put uh, more money into the actual stationery for our buildings and facilities, as, as we term it. So we are investing more in that, and that programme will run for the next several years. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the review on the corridor. That's the consultants uh, have been appointed or about to be appointed. They start in January. It's a 20-week programme. So they will, they, will have the, they will have that. It goes back into the department and after 20 weeks for, for a, a peer review. Uh, and we won't. I mean, we will stick to the timelines. Sorry? It will be in the main. Yeah, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Deputy O'Keeve. Currently, under the NDP, there is there is no there is there is no study. There is no look at uh, connecting to Dublin Airport. It's not our, our plans at the moment revolve around some of the things I've just been talking about: is is getting more fleet, uh, increasing the capacity of fleet, moving to electric uh, and, and electrifying the line out to Maynooth uh, and across down to Hazel Hatch, uh, and and completing the four tracking from. Clondalk and into Houston to, to, to unlock that side of, of the network and give us more capacity. So there currently is no, we don't have anything on, on our books to uh, plan for Dublin Airport uh, and to be honest it's not, it's not on our radar, uh, is, is the honest answer. Uh,
successor mentioned it to me? Oh, well, it's not currently. It's uh, and it'll be open and honest with you. It's not on my radar. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of things to do under the NDP. We have more plans than we have NDP funding. So if any more funding com comes available, uh, we will put our hand up and say we can we can do this and we can do this to add to the service. But but currently there is there is no plan for it. Um, your comments around uh, or more are, right, uh, are correct, uh, and that's what. We have looked at it, we've modelled it, we can do a 15 minute service by putting a, a loop in or more on a second platform. Um, and we believe that that is, uh, this, this has to be done in stages. I mean, nobody's going to give us the funding to build a complete new railway with, yeah. with four or five stations at each end. But I think, um, and I, I have taken the, the proposal to the, uh, to the NTA, uh, and they are looking at funding it. They agree it, it's a good proposal, uh, and it would be the first step in, in <coughs> significantly improving the, the services for Galway. The Ring Road, will, I suppose, help the Connemara people go around Galway uh, and anybody going to the west, but the Galway City Centre is still congested and trains being able to get right into Air Square uh, is the right thing to do. So that's currently with the NTA. Uh, we will be supporting it very strongly. We think it's the right thing to do uh, and we believe it. The right thing to do is double track the whole line because that, that allows you to keep on the But the first step on it uh, would be to do, do the piece in the middle at Horn Moor where you can cross trains every 15 minutes uh, and, and that would become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and you just keep extending to the two ends yeah. then. Yeah. Chairman. Thanks very much. Um, Deputy Smith, please. Thank you very much. And Jim, thank you very much. Sorry, no, I asked a question. In the meantime, to increase frequency into Galway, you know, you can't, you're physically limited from Athenry to Galway, yeah. but so that people from Limerick and Clonatlone could get more trains into Galway, was consideration given to termination trains coming from Ennis and getting people to transfer on the train at just at the commuter times yeah. uh, so that, so that you know, whether you're coming from the Ennis side or particularly that you have more options to get into government to increase the commuter usage on the line. We haven't looked at it recently. We did look at it before, um, as, as you will probably all know. Uh, long sections of single track make it very awkward to cross trains um, and it's all about timings then and you have, you have to go to, you know, down to Gart to cross, the, to cross the next train. So it's the infrastructure doesn't suit a, a high frequency because it's single line. So we can look at uh, can we change the commuter patterns, but you're taking out something else. You're delaying a Dublin train, you're taking out a train going the other direction that's probably giving a service all the way into, into Limerick. And it's, all, it's a balance, it's always a balance between um, serving one end more than serving the other end. But certainly it was something we would look at, but the, I think the solution is to do one more, and that's the that's that's the, the first big step along, along proving the proving the, the need for it. When you I don't want to, keep, but just one quickie on that. Yeah. When you're talking about the loop, and I'm only going for the very, the minimum solution, the loop yeah, yeah. with the double platform. Are you talking about that possibly happening in two years, five years, ten years? Um, oh, two to four years. Okay. I mean, uh, it, it's not uh, from our perspective. Once we get the green light, it's not a big project for us. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so Deputy Smith. Thank you, Jim, for your presentation here today. Uh, I'm from the constituency of Cavan Monaghan, and I waited with bated breath in your opening. Um, commentary, if you like, on your plan, your national plan, and I heard lots about the south of the country and the, the transport hub and Waterford and Cork and Limerick, and I'm delighted for those areas that are so well, I suppose, facilitated in terms of um, rail transport. Um, I wondered if um, you could maybe elaborate or maybe disclose some of the plans you may have for north of, we'll say, the Galway to, to, to Dublin line. I know Sligo was mentioned, and I appreciate how animated and passionate Deputy McLaughlin got about that particular line. Um, obviously, I have a keen interest. There are lines and existing lines, as we know, to Navan and on to Kingscourt. Um, and we have very much got a very heavy industry there in terms of what Kingspan and Gypsum and other industries in, in East Cavan and South Monaghan, um, in terms of, I suppose, the indigenous industry there and how much uh, it could be facilitated and expanded upon the potential um, that they may have or the capacity to grow if um, open freight rails were um, fac facilitated. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk to us a little bit today about your plans for a rail line to, to Navan, um, if that is part the second phase of that, progressively look forward to uh, opening, reopening the lines that exist to Kingscourt in East Cavan. Um, 
we, I would have to say, as a constituency, are very much behind the curve in terms of transport infrastructure. We have an M3 that stops very abruptly at the Cavan Mead border, and we have no motorway into Cavan 10. The N2 is still not upgraded to motorway status, and we have no rail line. Even though we have a rail line, we have no functioning rail line. Um, obviously, I would make the case that you know, for freight or heavy rail uh, to be the first phase uh, to Navan and then on to Kingscourt would be you know, hugely significant for the area. And unfortunately, I see myself travelling to Dublin how our motorways are now clogged up again with cars and vans for, you know, people working in Dublin filled with, you know, a van, maybe five lads again. We're back to that boom situation again in terms of where people have to travel and they do have to travel. And I mean, repeatedly we're told by the IDA and their lack of visits are being able to bring companies, the big companies, to Cavan, <coughs> counties like Cavan and Monaghan, we're actually in single, single digit uh, figures in terms of the visits. It's always about the lack of infrastructure. And I'm sure that the big companies who look to Cavan Monaghan look for broadband, they look for motorways and they look for rail. Um, so I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about your plans for the Cavan Monaghan line that exists. Um, as I said, to Navan and progressively to Kings Court potentially uh, for the future. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy King. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and your, your, um, the detail of it as well in regard to all of the lines. Uh, I live in, in South Leitrim, Drummond, Longford, Carrick and Shannon. That's the, the main areas where people from my part of the world will be heading toward Dublin. And certainly I know that the trains, particularly at weekends, are absolutely packed. And that is a huge problem for a lot of people, particularly students going back to college and that sort of thing, it's, it's a huge problem, the, 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 the congestion on those, on those lines. And I'm read with, with, um, uh, with happiness to see that you're talking about upgrading that to a, an hour-by-hour hour, uh, service. And I just wonder, has there a time scale in respect of that? You said two hourly from Westport and, and, and every hour from Sligo. Uh, also in regard to the, the whole issue of, of freight rail, um, I'm conscious that there is preparing some directives coming from Europe in regard to freight transport, and particularly road haulage, and pressure coming on that uh, from the point of view of CO2 emissions and all of that. Uh, and it, it's something that I know, talking to somebody in, in the road haulage sector, they're, they're quite concerned about. And it's really what's happening is that, you know, from a European perspective, they're saying, you know, more of this stuff needs to go onto rail and go onto rail, which is uh, has a has a, a lower carbon footprint. And uh, is there any plans around that? Because as it seems at the moment, looking from the outside, you know, the the um, just carrying passengers is already chock a block. And, and if there's to be expansion in regard to, to the whole area of freight, it's going to become very difficult to be able to, to match up to that requirement. Uh, also in respect of the other, the other sectors, and I, I know the, um, you know, all, all of the West really, you know, really needs to get a grip as to, as to what, we're, what we're going to do. And, and while everything in every country, I suppose, orientates towards the capital city, at the same time, uh, certainly those of us in the West would like to see something happening with the Western Rail Corridor and with, with, with some sense that there's going to be some connectivity around that Western coast and what we can do in respect of that. Or what, what plans are there? Are there plans there? Are we looking at that again? Are we seriously considering that? Because ultimately, you know, if, if we step back from it, and we spoke earlier in the meeting, uh, in the private session, about, about you know, uh, economic development and what's going to happen, it is the part of the world that has the most potential because it is the least developed. And uh, I would be very happy to see that Irish Rail were considering uh, making applications for European funding for to upgrade tracks and to, to, bring, us, to bring us to a stage where uh, we can uh, compete, if you like, with the rest of the country in respect of that. And I, I, I just I don't know in regard to funding, I know, you know it's, it's, it's done uh, nationally to the Department of Transport, but I, I just wonder, uh, particularly the, the T10 avenue of funding from Europe, what plans are there? Uh, because at the moment there seem to be very little plans, certainly in regard to the North West. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much, um, I, It just occurred to me, um, um, Mr. Reid, in relation to say, the impact of Brexit um, on, on, on the network and you know, particularly the Dublin Belfast route. Have you any contingency plans um, or have you considered the impact the fallout of Brexit may have on, on, on the network? And, just being parochial as well in relation to Ennis, um, 
station, have you any plans to upgrade it? I, I know there was an issue in relation to facilitating wheelchair users, um, and have you advanced plans to deal with that particular situation? Um, and also, in relation to booking online, say, true tickets, say, from Ennis to, to Derry, say, for example, I, I know you can go into a station and, and pay for it there, but can you do that online, or have you any plans to, to address that situation? Thank you, Deputy. I got, I got a cold shiver over there at the start. I thought you were going to ask me, could I solve Brexit? <laughs> but, uh, um, sorry, if I take him uh, as I got him, Deputies, um, uh, Deputy Smith, the Navin King's Court line, uh, yeah, it, it, ha it has potential. Is it in any of our current planning? No, it's not. It's not part of the, uh, of the NDP. Um, and if I link it to some of, 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 of Deputy Kenny's comments as well or, or around freight, we have, we have a policy, for, and even my predecessor had a policy, of, of maintaining the lines we have and maintaining the infrastructure we have and not, not doing what was done in the 60s where we closed and abandoned lines and then, uh, and, and then we lost them. Um, so look into the future. We recognise that a lot of these lines may become very, very relevant. Um, so we intend to keep these, the, these lines uh, in, in our ownership, so to speak. Uh, and as plans develop for them, be, be, able, be able to move forward with them. Uh, King's Court, uh, currently, there, there isn't a plan either with the department or with us. Or, uh, and to be honest, we haven't put any plan to the department that says, um, can we now go to King's Court? Uh, I'm happy to start looking at it. It would probably it would go into the next phase of NDP. But uh, I take the underlying point that if we don't stop planning for these things, they will never happen. Uh, but in our, in our, and could I ask you if you would do that yes. to start looking at that because I think that's hugely relevant yeah. uh, especially in light of Brexit uh, and also I suppose the pressure in terms of uh, CO2 emissions I think yeah. would be foolish not to be thinking that far ahead and can I ask you the question can you confirm to me is that line being maintained to King's Court at the moment? King's Court uh, I think it's been out to Tower Mines yes uh, and beyond King's Court and Cavan King, King's Court and Cavan uh, it's under care maintenance current, isn't it? Yeah. It is a yeah, yeah. yeah it's just I would a, suggest you have been very familiar with yeah, the line yeah. because as I drive by it most days that it's not being maintained or perhaps not being maintained the way it should because I, I do think the infrastructure is there and there could be more work done to ensure that it is maintained. I appreciate the fact yeah. these things take time, yeah. planning needs to be put in place and funding needs to be put in place and I do think ultimately uh, the most important thing at this moment in time which can be done is to maintain the line. Yeah. Okay. Take your point. Um, sorry, the uh, freight is, tends to be high volume, uh, long haul. That's, that's the model that, that works very, very well uh, for, for, for any freight operation. That said, we have some freight operations acro uh, across the, the, the network at the moment, um, and we, are work we actually have started our, my board has asked me to look at what the future of freight is, so the timing is probably, uh, is probably good in that we are now starting to say what opportunities uh, could we start looking at for freight because of the environmental impact, because of what we could move off of road. Off of road. So we are re-looking at our freight operation. We cannot subvent freight uh, within our own, within our own uh, freight has to wash its face, um, so we can't we, we can't subvent it or we can't use any uh, public funds for it. That's just the way it's structured. But we are starting to to um, look at freight. Uh, our board have, uh, we have given us the task of saying um, what are the what is the potential for freight? What should we be targeting in the future, and how should we get there? Uh, and then looking at what the capital uh, cost of doing that would be, what capital infrastructure we would need. So. It, it's a work in progress for us at the moment, uh, and there's, 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 no, there's no real plan beyond that. Um, one of the things, I suppose, that's important, and, and you mentioned it, Deputy Kenny, is uh, the Taoiseach spoke only a couple of weeks ago about the fact of the, the Atlantic corridor almost needing to grow at double the rate of, uh, of Dublin if, 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 we, if we have to sustain these issues. Uh, and we, all the things we want to do with increased services, with hourly services into the regions, is to assist that uh, and to make all the con connectivity work. Uh, and we, uh, it is very much our plan to continue the investment programme on infrastructure and to continue, as, uh, as I referenced earlier to other deputies, uh, of reducing journey times and, 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 and improving fleet. Uh, and that is, so that's the first step for us. That's, the, that's the, the, the big issue at the moment. We need more carrying capacity and we need to reduce journey times. So, uh, but I think it aligns with, with, the, with the aspiration for, 
um, to develop the, the, the Atlantic Corridor. Um, Chairman, Brexit, we, have, we are looking at Brexit. Uh, it is very important to us from the Enterprise Service, the Dublin Belfast Service. That service is probably very symbolic, um, uh, as much as anything else, uh, of, of, of what has happened in our country for, for decades. And a hard Brexit would be, uh, would be very traumatic for it because uh, driver, all the drivers would lose their licences, the certifications, the safety certifications for, for, for Northern Ireland Railways to operate in the Republic would be an issue. Uh, the fleet itself would be an issue. So we have a working party together with uh, Northern Ireland, uh, with uh, Translink, uh, and the Northern Ireland Railways is a subset of Translink, looking at how we would manage uh, a hard Brexit. We're working on the, on the, on the basis of worst-case scenario. If, if there's a step back from that, uh, there's a step back from that. But we have a, we have a team looking at how we, would, how we would manage next April if there was a hard, a hard Brexit. And the focus of the team is normal service from the customer's point of view. So whatever we need to do put behind that, or whatever arrangements we need to put behind that, or whatever we have to put in place behind that, that the, 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 the service runs and that the, the, it, it's not disrupted. That is very, very much our plan. The upgrade of Innes uh, is part of, I mentioned to uh, one of the other deputies about, we have a seven-year plan put in place now for start reinvesting in the station, so Innes will be, will be, part, of, will be part of that, uh, as will all stations. Uh, we have um, the true ticketing uh, is part of, our, of a programme we're running called Customer First, where we have, you, you probably if you use the website, you'll see the website has changed, and it's a much more user-friendly environment and better. Uh, as, that, as, we, as phase two and phase three, that roll out, true, true ticketing will come, will come uh, as part of that. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Reid. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, Jim, could I just ask you, when you are putting together any plans on this in relation to the Kingscourt line, if you could just look at the possibility of Drogheda, which is a very busy line, as we know, and exists, and, and all the rest, perhaps you know, connecting that with Navin, and then, of course, Kingscourt as a progression from that. And I w would ask you if you would feed back into the committee if you would feed back into the committee in relation to the plans that you put together that will be for submitting to uh, a national development plan. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. We'll do that. Thank you. I, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mead and Mr. Hedderly for your presence here today and your cooperation and engagement with the committee. And we look forward to further engagement in, in the future. So I, this meeting now stands adjourned. And I propose that the Joint Committee uh, would meet on Wednesday the 12th of December. Uh, 2018. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay.